Um, without further ado, let's talk about UX trends for 2021. So I gave this talk for the first time last year, and I have to say it's a very nerve wracking experience. Um, uh, you know, anytime you start talking about design trends and things like that, uh, it automatically makes you feel like you have this giant ego to be standing on this platform talking about things and makes me very uncomfortable because I don't feel that way. Um, but I do just kind of like to share a few, or I just want to share a few thoughts about things that I see happening in society and in our industry and just have a start, start the conversation about uh, what we might be working on or some new things that we might see in 2021. Um, this is by no means a comprehensive list. Um, and I'm super interested to hear your feedback, um, either in the Q&A at the end of the session or uh, in one of the sessions afterwards, um, but also on our Slack channel. So please do join. Um, we'd love to hear the things that you're seeing. Um, if you think I'm wrong about something, you can tell me. If you think I'm right, you can tell me. If you have stuff to add, dialogue going on Slack. Um, so I very much tried to avoid the classic, what we've learned from lockdown and what we've learned from COVID. Um, I don't want it to be a classic talk like that. However, I am going to use some of the bigger events of 2020, um, uh, including COVID, to introduce some of the trends that I think we'll see uh, coming in 2021. Uh, frankly, I don't see anything like, I'm not going to talk about anything super futuristic or brand new because I also like to keep these quite tangible, like really like what is our community going to be looking at this year? Um, so I try to keep some variety across UI trends, um, new types of experiences, uh, maybe new business uh, trends that are popping up. Uh, uh, so we might see some new types of clients or demands from new, from clients. Um, uh, but I try to keep it as close as possible to, to uh, trends and things that we might actually work on this year. Um, and again, uh, we'll see if I'm right later on, but uh, also please add your own. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is um, tangible experiences. And of course, um, you know, for years, uh, we've had the task of largely translating common tasks to the digital world. Um, and for the most part, that involves generating forms, flows, dashboards, um, and we've created lots of different libraries that offer us you know, solid basic tools to get stuff done. Um, and that's great uh, because having a solid grasp of design libraries and design languages is totally a bedrock or part of the bedrock of uh, a UX career. But yeah, at the end of the day, we're still really fixated on sort of static UI design um, on a flat screen. Um, and I think that one thing that lock lockdown showed us is that there's still a huge world of experiences uh, that we haven't been able to tangibly translate online, or at least not very well yet. Um, and of course, that's natural because these are usually the really difficult cases. Um, and before, we haven't been forced as much to, to actually tackle them. Uh, but now we really are. Um, so I think it's kind of a, a, a bold new world where we can start to expand our toolbox and look into some new things. Now, that's not to say that traditional uh, sort of, you know, flat screen design isn't uh, exploring uh, new frontiers. You know, the morphisms are nothing new. Uh, it started with the skew morphism uh, trend from the early iPhone days, which led to sort of this backlash onto flat design. Um, then we had material and now, there's a lot more cool experimentation going on with um, these very tangible feeling uh, flat surfaces. Everything feels very knobby and buttony and these beautiful soft shadows. And, you know, I do find this visually pleasing uh, and I appreciate where they're going with it. For me personally, um, this doesn't pass the accessibility test. So I don't really see it going too much further. Um, but, you know, it's still quite visually pleasing. I think that uh, there's a time and a place for these types of, of sort of more tangible flat designs. Um, similarly, glass morphism seems to be kind of making a bit of a comeback. Um, again, for a time and a place, it can be quite beautiful. Um, obviously, people hated it on Windows Vista <laughs> back in the early mid 2000s or so. Um, this is a better execution. But still, for me, it doesn't score very many points on accessibility. 
um, and overall ease of use. Um, you really have to have great eyesight <laughs> uh, and coordination to be able to use these types of things, but hey, kudos. Um, I love this trend in um, taking product photography to this whole new immersive level. Um, this is just one example that I liked, but you know, it's, it's really product photography going beyond just the classic product shot, showing how it might feel inside. I mean, this is just such a yummy user experience um, uh, that goes beyond just sort of classic product photography. And I hope um, in the future that we can see more of it. Um, and I think that uh, this new trend is something that I find really interesting and exciting. Um, for me, this just screams texture. Um, it kind of uses sort of this absurdist uh, technique to really make you feel like you can just squeeze this uh, whatever this foam is on the bottom of the shoe. Um, yeah, and so for me, like this is like product photography or you know, using sort of 3D graphics uh, to really convey like a feeling and an experience of the product um, instead of just a flat um, picture of it. And then also the colors and the absurdity of it, I think is totally um, on trend and very cool. Um, 3D product photography, obviously, it's nothing new, but I think it's, again, something that's going to have a bit of a resurgence this year in terms of, like, how far can we take this? Um, also, just a lot more brands are going to be open to investing in uh, these sort of more 3D uh, immersive experiences, you know, and you can combine it with a lot of other things, you know, like with these fancy graphics or, um, or you know the, the bright color palette and stuff that will be uh, on trend this this year. So I just feel like a lot of us are going to be working with these types of experiences um, in our interfaces more. And then there's this whole fun world. Um, I don't condone TikTok. I uh, I know about the security risks and all of that, but I mean you gotta get in this. You know, it's just so much fun. It's really a peek into uh, people's living rooms and lives. And they're just using all these new experiential elements like um, the candidness, the, the, the sort of the meme, uh, the meme world uh, of gifts and dance trends and uh, music. And, you know, it's, it's a 3D experience. There's AR, there's video. And it's just like a glimpse into sort of this really fun new world of immersive experiences that, that brands will start to will continue to get into as well. Um, and likewise, again, influenced kind of by the isolation and flatness of our locked down lives. Um, it's no surprise that live experiences, scary as they can be, um, are cropping up more and more of people just picking up their phone and reaching out to whoever's there and, um, um, and using those interactions to, to uh, convey an experience or just to connect with each other. Um, and also, I don't think it's any coincidence that these technologies that are really kind of ushering in um, these sort of bigger technology trends of AR, um, augmented reality, and VR, virtual reality. I really think that these are two technologies that have been trying to show their real value for a long time. Um, and I'm hoping that this year will actually mark kind of like um, that they'll really put them in the limelight this year. And the reason why I think this is just because they're super fun. You know, AR, it may seem silly, but you know, Snapchat really gave AR a home when the nerds didn't really know what to do with it. And anytime you see these types of new technologies becoming really fun uh, and lots of people starting to use them, it means that people are getting more and more comfortable with them and people are thinking about new and um, maybe more intellectual ways of using them. And VR, of course, found its uh, niche in gaming. And um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about what this guy might be doing. Uh, but uh, this guy with the googly eyes is really having a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, gaming and frankly, porn, uh, since the beginning of my career, I've always told people, watch for technology that's coming out of gaming and porn because just they're always doing the thing, the the first thing with the with the new technology and figuring it out, and bringing it to the masses because this is what people like to use. This is what people have fun with. Um, so anyway, so now that we're having fun with all of this, um, I really do think that we'll be entering uh, an era where we can start to really put it to work. 
Um, again, I don't want to spend this talk kind of going too far into cyberspace with like Tom Cruise style UI elements and you know using robots to operate on people in Botswana. Um, those are things that are coming. They're very very cool. Uh, most of us will probably not work on those types of things yet. Um, so I wanted to stick closer to home and just talk maybe about a few uh, areas that I think can really benefit from this technology um, that already are, but also that um, maybe there'll be uh, more investment in it this year. And, um, you know, us normies who work at normie agencies uh, will be able to have access uh, to um, cool technology projects like this. So I love these instruction manuals. Instruction manuals are super, super boring. Uh, and especially when it comes to things like cars and machinery. Um, I mean, usually these things like sit in your basements or in your trunk or something like that. And then when you really need them, it's forever to find the content. I think use, digitizing these things and using um, augmented reality to kind of demonstrate features is such a great use of this technology. Um, I think that there's huge potential for remote customer assistance, um, especially when troubleshooting or doing IT um, uh, maintenance tasks and things like that. It's incredibly expensive to send a technician to your home. Um, and I think a lot of the, the even just verifications or, or confirmations of troubleshooting can be done using AR and um, uh, video interfaces with uh, customer service staff. So opportunity for those of you who are working on um, you know, customer service and employee engagement uh, um, sides of things uh, to, to start looking into this and, and introducing it to your clients if, if they're not already investing in it. These are classics. It's nothing new. Um, product placement is super fun. IKEA has been working on it for a long time. Maybe some of you have already worked on some of these concepts. Um, but playing around with um, spatial planning um, or trying things on. Uh, uh, it's not new, but I'm really hoping that this is the year that companies really start heavily investing in stuff like this and that we all get a chance to work on really cool uh, product placements and trying on um, uh, elements like this, uh, especially since e-commerce is booming from the lockdown. And then, hello, Sexy. Um, it's been a while since uh, Google Glass kind of crashed and burned, but that doesn't mean that I haven't been working on making the next version of this. Uh, I believe this is the Amazon one. Um, I can confirm. Uh, but it's a lot better looking. Uh, they got the hipster uh, aesthetic down, and I think this is something that people could actually wear, um, if not uh, around in their daily life, at least as a work accessory to enhance your workplace. Um, so I think that this is pretty cool, and we'll continue to see sort of this wearable AR technology as well. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you did virtual tours during lockdown. I know that I uh, toured several uh, architectural houses in the US <laughs> during lockdown. Um, sometimes it was just a, a guided video, um, but there's several companies working on different types of virtual walkthroughs. Um, Google launched its arts and culture walkthrough so you can actually walk through the Musée d'Orsay in, in Paris. Um, and there's some other kind of really cool, oops, cool museum applications that are doing this um, uh, uh, but after using a VR headset technology and things like that. So I'm thinking that sort of this like real world um, uh, experiential uh, sector and the travel sector, they're not gonna give this up when COVID goes away um, because they recognize that there will be an audience for people who can't afford to travel or who just still don't want to travel, uh, but still want to experience these amazing things. So I, I definitely foresee investments in this area as well um, so that we can all enjoy the world's splendors for living room using uh, virtual technology. Um, again, back to sort of like um, uh, I, I've already known several cases of uh, employees, uh, companies looking into uses for employee training. I think this is cool, especially for dangerous things like this. <laughs> you don't actually have to light a fire to teach someone how to put it out. Uh, so these types of situations are perfect for virtual uh, virtual reality. Um, also just virtual employee training, um, either from home or even in the factory, I think they'll continue to use these. Um, it's a lot easier to kind of train people on the basics before you put a really expensive piece of machinery in their hands. Um, and so I just see like this growing and growing and growing as a huge um, sector and uh, 
employer of uh, UX professionals. Just make sure that you get it right because I've seen some of these early versions. This is from KFC and I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this dismembered chicken part. All I know is that the kernel in the corner there is gonna knife me if I get it wrong. So, you know, that's the other thing with these sort of virtual reality areas, like be aware of the creepy, <laughs> okay? All right, let's go on to the next one. So again, not a new thing, omni-channel. We've been talking about this for years, right? And again, I don't think it's anything new. It's something that's coming back. And again, um, I would just say, arguably one of the biggest losers of this year's Hunger Games, I, I mean, uh, Corona Games, is the small businesses who did not learn the lesson and um, and diversify their channels, their channel strategy, or at least uh, try some digital channels when we told them they should. Um, I mean, we've been selling these types of strategies to businesses for years uh, that they need to add digital channels, they need to connect it with uh, uh, with the in-store but also offer uh, lots of other ways for people to be able to buy things um, but when lockdown happened a lot of local businesses just stopped um, so what does this mean for us i mean yeah we we know all of these things we have all of these tools there's tons of platforms out there um, this is the really great one uh you know payconic the thing that i like about payconic is they made it so so easy for uh small businesses and sort of the digital resistant players to be able to use this. You just have to slap a sticker down and the onboarding was super easy. And I think this is the challenge for the next level of omni-channel um, strategy is making it extremely accessible for the ones who are still not doing it. So these sort of digital laggards or even resistors. Um, so how can we scale, you know, we used to sell these huge omni-channel budgets with, you know, fancy, uh, um, uh, senior consultants and big design teams to kind of map everything for them. Uh, but now it's time to take that and scale it down to extremely easy, extremely affordable solutions uh, to get everyone online and really level the playing, the, the playing field for, for these other users as well. So that'll be interesting. Uh, I think the other big kind of slap in the face when it came to just online uh, uh, e-commerce this year was that Belgium was kind of finally forced to acknowledge that we're just not very good at this. Um, our neighbors in the UK, in France, in Germany, and um, especially in the Netherlands, they've been investing in e-commerce for 15 plus years, and Belgium really only put some serious skin in the game about five years ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, but right now, in terms of quality and traffic on e-commerce websites, we're uh, 19th in Europe. So we are not up there. And being so close to these other markets, um, they've been able to completely take over the e-commerce market here. And that became so apparent when lockdown happened. Um, in fact, there was even some political backlash against it. And the thing is, it's like, look, they're just better. It's not their fault that they kind of got their act together sooner uh, and launched these tools and that uh, Belgian can recognize that and are using them. Um, but I do think that uh, now we've seen the problem, we've acknowledged the problem, and uh, I don't know if this is the year that we will actually solve it, but I do have a feeling that this is the year that companies and the government will be throwing a lot of money uh, at solving this problem and figuring out what does e-commerce mean in Belgium. Um, and this is not to say that we necessarily launch our own version of ball.com or Zalando, uh, but it does mean that we need to have a better approach to e-commerce um, that aligns with our values, you know, hello small businesses maybe, um, and is very simple and easy to use uh, so that we can um, compete with some of these other bigger players outside of our borders. All right, another thing I wanna talk about is ecosystems. Once again, the trend tonight is nothing super new, uh, but again, I just wanna talk about how um, uh, it's just maturing and, and really uh, becoming more and more of our daily work. 
Um, and again, I do think that this is a lesson we can take from COVID. Um, you know, collaboration was essential to um, managing the response to COVID, um, whether that means scientists sharing uh, vaccine knowledge or hospitals sharing resources or governments sharing knowledge so that they could make decisions really quickly. Um, I just think that this uh, um, uh, world of collaboration, uh, this influence of collaboration um, is going to heavily influence how we do our work in the coming years. Um, I mean, just last year, I think for the first time I was introduced to several new projects where groups of stakeholders were all collaborating, sometimes even competitors collaborating with each other. Um, I know that there's a lot of agencies and, and organizations and government organizations working on this. I just grabbed one example uh, from Post Station in Brussels. Um, they are uh, assembling these big um, ecosystems of partners uh, that are sort of big corporations and startups and think, uh, uh, think tanks and then just other, other uh, experts in the area to tackle things like mobility, uh, energy platforms, um, food waste, uh, packaging waste, stuff like that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm also just seeing this more and more as I, as I, as I look around to what agencies are doing. I also see um, CEOs sharing strategy. So two or three CEOs coming together that are maybe in similar or, or, or different uh, areas saying like, we get together and talk about the future of work, that kind of thing. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and I'm just kind of curious for what that means for us and how we might be able to translate that. Um, on one hand, um, you know, we already know that co-creation is great. Uh, we do it on a on a, a, a client level where we try to get in, you know, marketing and IT and some users and do a do some exercises there together. Um, but I think that this is really uh, opening that up to even more companies and more partners. Um, and what I find is often um, even competitors. Uh, can benefit from a shared platform that they build together. Um, and I, I felt this a lot a couple years ago when I worked on a couple experiments around in-car delivery and in-home delivery. Um, the main takeaway was is this cannot be a fragmented ecosystem. Um, the services who need to use this technology will never be able to build on it if Daimler, Mercedes, Volkswagen, and all these different, and Volvo, if they all have their own platforms, it really needs to be something central that they all work together on. Um, so I, uh, I really do think that um, companies would, would do better to come together to create a platform rather than everyone spend money on their own and then spend all this time competing and then no one wins in the end and definitely the customer will lose. Um, linking services. Uh, this is another sort of ecosystem idea. Again, it's not new, but I still find myself hard pressed to think of uh, examples just off the top of my head, aside from uh, booking um, flights and hotels together, uh, where there's been huge strides in this. Uh, but I think that this is something, again, that we can learn from this collaborative environment that we're in. You know, like if I just imagine, you know, I bought a home a couple of years ago, if I could consolidate all of like, the administration in one area and then book a mover and then hook up all of my services and my Wi-Fi uh, and even get a nice little welcome package at the end of it uh, all on one ecosystem. Like how amazing would that be? Um, and I think that as UX designers and also just as, as business and product owners, um, we really need to be looking for these types of opportunities and reaching out across, you know, um, uh, these dividing lines between the two of us and really focus on these much bigger user journeys that are uh, outside of just our own tasks and looking for opportunities to collaborate. All right, and then the last one. You know this is gonna be a loaded one if it starts with the elephant in the room. Um, so last year we did, I touched on workplace um, trends a little bit. And it was mainly just to kind of congratulate UX designers on being so awesome and how we're really good at um, kind of instilling teamwork and um, being a team enabler because we have these very horizontal, very woke personalities of where we're really in touch with the user and society and what's going on. And so we kind of have this like natural ability to bring people together and create change at work. Uh, so that's what I talked about last year. 
Um, what I want to talk about this year was obviously inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. And I know that that specific movement is um, very much rooted in America. I acknowledge that. Uh, but it was a worldwide movement, uh, which basically means that every country and every culture is dealing with this in some way. Um, and uh, was I, when I was putting this together, you know, I, I Obviously, I can express my own experience uh, working in the, the, the digital world here, um, uh, and so can you, um, and agree that you know it is largely dominated by um, you know uh, white Flemish males in their 20s, 30s, and 40s at the most. Um, and I did a Google image search for Antwerp Design Agency, and the top six photos that included teams uh, were all white males, except for two white females. Um, so I blurred out the, the faces. And I know maybe some of these pictures come from some of the same agencies, but these were the top Google results. And that's kind of a dumb way to get your information. So I did find um, some pretty hardcore statistics from uh, creativebelgium.be. This is our industry statistics from uh, 2019, as I believe when this was um, when this was published. And what we can see is that um, they're reporting that in the creative industry, 92% uh, of, of the employees identify as white European, at least 92%. Some of them preferred not to say. Um, the first language was predominantly Dutch, 71%. Um, OK, it's not exactly in line with the population um, of the country. So there's a little bit of a, a leaning there. Um, when you look at gender, OK, you might first Oh, 53% female. That's awesome. So check that one off. However, um, <laughs> you have to couple that with the fact that uh, men are twice as likely to be in a senior role as women. Uh, almost 72% of respondents in Belgium um, have a male line manager. And in certain roles, as you get higher up in the management uh, 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 ladder, such as an art director, the likelihood of having a male line manager was as high as 97% sometimes. So sure, we're employing a lot of females, but they're heavily concentrated in lower positions. Uh, and there's almost no one in uh, leadership roles, especially at the very top C-suite level. Um, and frankly, it's no surprise to just based on my um, cursory look around the um, uh, around the agency scenescape. So I just wanted to unpack this a little bit um, based on my own thinking and just based on some of the articles and, and people that I've listened to uh, on this issue in the last, um, uh, well, few years. Um, and I just want to say, like, it's a culture issue. It's not a people issue. It's a culture issue. Um, when you're part of the dominant culture, you feel really comfortable there. You know, um, you're more relaxed. Everything feels familiar and you can perform your best, best work. When you're not, it's a lot more stressful. Um, you don't really feel like you fit in. So you try to fit in. And sometimes this can come off as inauthentic. And so you're excluded even more. It causes a lot of stress. And when you're under a lot of stress, you just don't perform as well. And so it's just this cycle, you know? Um, and I'm not gonna say that like men or white people are um, like uh, actively seeking to exploit people. It's really not my intention to say that. And I don't believe it. It's just that if you're not feeling this problem on a daily basis, you're also not um, trying you're, or likely to try to fix it on a daily basis. It's something that you really have to, to work at. So I wanna just talk about a few things that I've collected um, about concrete things that we can do. And um, one is just to commit and to hire. And the thing is, is this really has to start at the top. So I'm really looking at senior managers, CEOs and founders. If you're not committed, this won't work. Because the thing is, equality has been a bottom up burden for generations actually. And it's just not working. It just doesn't work. It doesn't go fast enough. It has to be a top-down thing now. Um, and it also needs to be addressed on all levels. It's not just setting a quota. It's setting a quota in the senior management levels as well as the, as the entry level points. So that's definitely the first step. Um, and then once you work that, uh, once you set that intention, um, you have to listen. So it's not just enough to fill the quota. If you still expect people to kind of fit in with this dominant culture that you've uh, established for years and years and years, uh, that's not really, yeah, uh, that's not really the intention there, is it? Um, they're there to do a good job for sure, but they're also there to help change the culture, 
not just fill a quota and fit in. And they need to have the mandate to be able to do that. And the third is a super easy thing that every company could do tomorrow if they set it down. And that is the fact that just equality goes both ways and gender neutral family policies have been proven to be one of the easiest and most effective ways to close the gender gap uh, in your company. It frees women to compete and equalizes the men's roles. And frankly, it's just better for kids too. So that's a very solid first step that we can take at least towards um, gender neutrality in the workplace um, uh, and then start working on um, kind of hiring and committing to the others. And lastly, I do have to say, this is a bold thing, but if you are a woman or a person of color and the lack of diversity in your office is affecting you, and it does, um, there are statistics that say that it does in Belgium, um, and your CEO or your management won't make a commitment it's just time to leave. Um, uh, statistics show that you're not going to be able to fix this problem yourself, especially from the bottom up. You just need to leave and tell them why you're leaving and hope that um, they will learn from that and start uh, taking steps to, to address it. Um, and I will say on a personal level, I'm looking for a new job right now. No, I'm not plugging myself, but I actually <laughs> have been building a long list of perfectly talented agencies that I won't work for just because there's such an extreme lack of diversity uh, in general, but especially at that top management level. And um, and yeah, it's because they're predominantly white male Flemish dudes. And um, yeah, I'm hoping I find a job this year because frankly, it's uh, it's really most of them. And lastly, if you are a man and or a white person um, and you see exclusion happening, and it does, 52% of people of color say that they feel uncomfortable at work or they've witnessed uh, a negative uh, experience, please speak up. It's really important because it's not only hurting people, it's also hurting your business. Um, and also please don't expect us, women or people of color, uh, to do all the work for, you know, for ourselves. Um, or to even educate you. It's kind of exhausting, actually. Um, please educate yourself and be proactive. And again, I'm sure you've seen these messages in mainstream media. I just want to reiterate them. Again, as UX designers, we really do kind of have our finger on the pulse. Um, we matter. People listen to us when it comes to defending the user. Um, and we can play a great role in defending our, um, our fellow employees as well. All right, and on that intense notes, um, I just want to again ask you to share your picks on Slack. Um, respond to what I said. Let me know if you disagree or agree with anything that I said. I uh, have a very thick skin. Uh, you can say what you like. Um, and again, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. And then lastly, um, I just want to say again, we're recruiting speakers. Um, if you've got some opinions on cool new trends that you're seeing for 2021, uh, please share them with the group. Um, tell us all about what you're seeing as well. If it's one thing or if it's a group of things, um, we're super interested in that. Um, and thank you very much. That's the end. I think Bob is going to come in and ask questions. Yes, yes. here I am. You can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. The sentence of 2020. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I figured we'd open 2021 with that. Um, yeah, we haven't really received questions just yet. Just a few items of praise that I've been seen flying around. Uh, <laughs> Regarding the new morphism, uh, Johan said the only time and place that it is applicable is on Dribble. Don't ever put it anywhere else. Uh, yeah, and I agree, my, actually. My, my personal favorite was uh, from Hido, who said, you just quite possibly gave us the best excuse when our uh, employer goes to our browsing history. Always look at porn for the next uh, technology <laughs> stacks. So, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, a piece of a piece of advice from uh, Michael, who says there's a book, Invisible Women, uh, mm -hmm. that shows how uh, design is biased to the male body. Um, he yeah. really advises that book. Um, other than that, yeah, I see we've gone slightly over time. Uh, there is a special session set up that is called Q&A with Annie. Okay. Um, so we can continue this conversation there. For everyone else, we're going to take a few minutes uh, break and we will be back here at uh, 8 o'clock. Yes. Great. Thanks. See you there. All right. See you in a bit. Bye.